Connie, Greg, thank you. I am a serious consultant in my day job. Look, thank you. Move on. Where's the clicker? Excellent. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, we now have a panel on uh, State Roundup Policy and Strategy. I'm your facilitator, Mike Ritchie. I'm the MD of MRA Consulting Group. I get the pleasure of introducing and throwing up a bunch of con controversial issues for you uh, for about 10 minutes, and then I'll invite the panellists up. I'll ask a few Dorothy Dixon questions of them, and then we're opening it up to the floor. You'll have at least, hopefully, an hour of questions, so please think about your questions, write them down, uh, and throw a few curlies at the state reps. So. So broad kind of sweep for those of you who are new to waste or uh, just want a bit of background. Waste is growing at a compound average growth rate of 4.8% across the country. We're very, very good at generating waste. Uh, about two thirds of that is um, per capita consumption growth and about one third of it is population growth driven. So we're all consuming more and bigger flat screen TVs. Uh, on the very positive side, if you look over a 20 year horizon, we generated 22 million tonnes 20 years ago. We're now generating about 53 million tonnes. Um, by the way, interpret this picture as waste is like a river. It flows downhill to the cheapest price. And no matter what you do, if it's cheap, it's going there. And that, that is a reality statement that all councillors, all policy people need to understand. If it's cheaper to landfill it, that's where the vast bulk of it is going, in spite of a few beautiful initiatives and great little projects. River, waste flows downhill to the cheapest price. You'll see that our recycling rate, on the other hand, has grown massively, and that's testimony to the people in this room, to the industry, to councillors, to state governments who have driven the policy settings to get the waste out. And if you'd been at this conference 20 years ago, the conference was all about how do we run better landfills, uh, how do we, you know, should we in fact be landfilling organics and capturing the gas, uh, recycling's expensive, let's not do too much of it. Uh, and in 20 years, we have had seen a major sea change towards circular economy, resource recovery, and that's, again, testimony to the people in this room. So we've now grown our recycling rate up to 61 per cent, but notice at the bottom, the absolute amount of waste going to landfill hasn't changed in 20 years. We're still landfilling about 20 million tonnes. So if we want to actually get that down, we need some more innovation. We need to accelerate the rate of reform. Uh, to make sure that we actually capture those residual streams that are a bit harder to recycle and get them out. Another home truth, all recycling in Australia is subsidised by someone except for metal and cardboard, by and large. So mobile phones are subsidised, e-waste is subsidised, curbside recycling is subsidised, it's subsidised by you and I ratepayers uh, in, a, in a gate fee we pay to MERV. So all recycling except metal and cardboard, by and large, is, is subsidised by someone. So the question then is, what's a reasonable additional subsidy to get these additional materials out of the waste stream? It's going to cost. It's going to cost money. What is our willingness to pay? Our economy is growing you know, happily, 27 years of uninterrupted economic growth, but waste is growing at about twice the rate. Uh, waste generation is twice the rate. So we have been singly unsuccessful in uncoupling economic growth from waste generation. Put it another way, the blue line at the top is waste generation, the green line is recycling, and waste to landfill is the red line. And if we want to get that down, we need to invest harder, faster into infrastructure and services at scale. Not dismissing the great little projects that people are doing around Australia, but we're landfilling 20 million tonnes. If we want to get that down, we need big bits of kit doing stuff. FOGO programs at council level, you know, right down to mattress recycling, but we need foremost, big bits of kit processing mixed waste streams. On the successes, 61% recovery rate. Waste collection in Australia is incredibly cost effective and incredibly efficient. Uh, testimony to local government in particular and to the waste industry. Remember that two thirds of all waste to landfill is commercial waste. One third is local government waste. Uh, we have reframed the debate in the last 20 years towards the kinds of articulations of circular economy that you hear. Uh, but the rate of change is too slow. So now a quick treatise on, a quick run through what the different states have done. So I say the rate of change is too slow. I'm going to run through this and then say this is the things I think we need to do more quickly and then you're going to ask all the hard questions of the panellists. 
So we have state strategies, we have state targets everywhere. You can see the performance of the actual is the coloured bar and the target is the top of the line. And you can see different states have very different targets, very different outcomes. We are good on some material streams. MSW is tracking pretty well. Uh, commercial waste, on the other hand, not so well. C and D, heavy, we do pretty well in C and D. C and D is as our, our best performing sector by far. So very different market signals, very different strategies at the state. Back in 2010, the national waste policy was first developed and it did a very useful matrix which said this is the program's interventions in each state. You can see it there. I won't bore you with the details. So Mike, in his usual fashion, decided well, I'll do it again in 2018, 19, just to stir the pot a bit. And that's Mike's interpretation being very generous of what we see now in the, uh, in the regulatory framework across the country. So to their credit, every state now has a strategy that says the ship of state is going towards circular economy and resource recovery. They didn't until you know, quite recently. Uh, it's rational for a state government to say, no, we're going to just stick with very cheap landfills that are well run. It's a rational economic policy, but now we've seen everybody say circular economy is the way we want to go strategically and they've all in, ad, adopted that. Targets, bit of a mix. Levies, bit of a mix. And then it starts to get pretty, uh, pretty disparate. The first and biggest one is the, imp the impact of the landfill levy. It drives, it, it, it does all the heavy lifting for resource recovery and recycling in this country. New South Wales has the highest levy at $140.20. Uh, and we're seeing that the, the, in Queensland we're now introducing a levy of $75 a tonne from the 1st of July. And the result of those levies is the landfill pricing that you see on this slide. That's what you and I pay when we go to a landfill. Very disparate and obviously sends very different market signals to the market as to whether to recycle or not. And remember that all waste will go to landfill unless there's a price signal or a regulatory signal to stop it going there. All right, so if you're faced with a $40 landfill price in Brisbane and it costs you $330 to landfill it in Sydney and $100 to get it there, guess where the waste is going? And we currently transport 1.2 million tonnes of waste from Sydney to Brisbane by road and rail because of the arbitrage of, of landfill levies. The Queensland Government is trying to fix that with its own levy, but that in and of itself is not enough to fix interstate arbitrage of waste. Uh, we need some other mechanism. And that's the landfill levies and to the credit of the New South Wales Government, the South Australian Government and now the Queensland Government, uh, with Vic and South Australia also in the pack. Uh, it's a very good outcome uh, and, it, and it needs to proceed and continue if we're keen about getting resource recovery to be meaningful. Bans across landfills, regulatory signals, bit of a mixed bag, nothing particularly happening in that space except the e-waste ban coming in in Victoria. Uh, starting uh, 1st of July. China National Sword, another area of uh, some action, more action in some states than others. Uh, councillors in the room, the 47 million, when I stood up here last year and talked about the 47 million from New South Wales, a couple of councillors went, yes, but it's not new money. I accept that point. Uh, it's there for reference that what you see is other states have done less and the federal government has done little. Uh, South Australia has done a little bit. Uh, oh, and by the way, the important thing there, Oh, no, forget it. God almighty, where am I going? No, go away. How do I go backwards? All right, here we go. Connie, help. Right, someone help me. All credibility out the door. With one slide. Gone. I'm a professional. Uh, yeah, so landfill levies, where do we get to? Right, landfill levies. So you know, a lot of movement going on, but not enough, not fast enough, depending on your sense of the rate of change that we need. Uh, landfill bans, bit of a mixed bag. Uh, China. Uh, ACOR wrote a very interesting report, which quick declaration we were involved with, which said if you want to de-risk curbside recycling in Australia, you actually only need to invest about $130 million once for capital refurb. Uh, now the landfill levies across the country raise about a billion dollars a year, a little bit more than a billion dollars a year. So it's a tiny one-off number. 
Uh, the question is, why aren't we just doing it? Right? Excellent question. And that reports on the website, on the ACOR website. So a couple of other quick initiatives that are going on around the country. Process engineered fuel. Uh, we see processing starting to emerge as an alternative to energy from waste because of the difficulty of getting approvals. Uh, so Victoria, ACT, uh, South Australia, processing residual high calorific waste into bales and exporting it for uh, thermal use in cement kilns in Asia. Uh, Product development, pull through, getting a market pull to get this stuff happening. Which states are actually pulling through recyclables, buying, preferencing glass, sand in road base, etc. Very patchy, very weak. Plastic bags, you'd think that would be easy. Most states doing it now, but a couple of holdouts. Container deposit scheme, big change in the last five years, really starting to you know, roll out there, but a couple of states still laggards. And onto my last couple of slides, data. I'm a consultant, so data is important to me. New South Wales EPA put out the State of the Environment report three weeks ago, a month ago, using 2014-15 data. Now, we're trying to get billions of dollars of investment in infrastructure, and, and investors come to us and say, give us good data. And we say, well, there just isn't good data across the country but worse in some states than others. And this is the kind of stuff we get for, at the federal level. The methods used by the Australian government for categorising data are not always the same as those used by the states, and figures presented may differ from the state reports. Now, we're a small country. There's 25 million of us. Surely we can, we can report a consistent data set that it can at least be aggregated at a level that says MSW, CNI, CMD, and, and our clients, investors, whatever, can actually make rational economic decisions. Uh, and even it goes so far, Gail mentioned this yesterday, we now have three different levels of waste generation in the country, introducing this concept of core waste uh, and then adding fly ash and adding hazardous waste on top of that. Now, uh, surely we can come to a consistent set of uh, definitions. So my last slide uh, before I introduce the panel, can't we just focus on a couple of key actions, aligning the strategies and the targets, getting the economic and regulatory signals right that actually make a difference, not diminishing the projects that everyone is involved with, but we need some broad, hard-hitting instruments like Europe to actually make this stuff happen, to rebuild the circular economy. Circular economy is not some idea, it's actually changing the economy. That is hard. You need good, big signals to make that happen. It's not going to happen because we come to a conference and talk about the circular economy. We need actually instruments that drive behaviour change and they're the kinds of instruments that will do it, proven around the world. We need to focus on infrastructure and we need consistent and timely data. My last slide, and particularly if you're like me and are concerned that the UN might be right in terms of having 12 years to pre prevent 1.5 degree climate change, if they're right, then there is a massive sense of urgency that we need. And that's what's missing in the debate at the moment around the, the strategies and policies the government are producing are slow. They're far too slow if you believe that climate change is real. Uh, and the waste industry alone can abate up to 60 million tonnes of emissions. That's 10 per cent of Australia's emissions profile. That's half of the Paris commitment in this room. Easy, relatively cheap, we know what to do. The three things we need to do are there. Recover the embodied energy of recycling, just get more recyclables out of landfill. Divert the organics and get those back out into compost, back on farms, which we need for a whole lot of other reasons, and capture the methane from our existing landfill stock. Not difficult, not expensive. We need to get on and do it. That's me, thank you. We're not going back there again. Leave it alone, is that the issue? Right, can I go back to the picture so I know who I'm introducing? <laughs> right, thank you. Thank you for your indulgence. I'll now introduce the panel. Uh, Alex Taylor, Alex is the Director of Waste and Regulation at ACT No Waste. Kylie Hughes, Director of Waste and Policy Legislation, Department of Environment and Science. Molly Tregoning. Uh, Director of 20-Year Waste Strategy with the EPA in New South Wales. Uh, Angela Hoffnagels, uh, Manager of Waste and Resource Recovery, Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning. Uh, Marcus Geisler, uh, ACE, uh, from the Chairman of the Waste Authority. 
and Stephen Sergi, Manager, Regulatory Reform Projects, Environment Protection Authority, South Australia. So, I, as I said, I have a couple of Dorothy Dixes to ask them to get us in the mood and please think about your questions. Uh, And if that slide comes up. I, I just wish their policy was so well aligned. I know, it's beautiful, isn't it? Lined up. We're going to get on really well. Okay, so I've thrown a bunch of. I've, can we get another chair? I've thrown a bunch. Come on, look at our I've thrown a bunch of Dorothy Dixes out there. So uh, this one is actually to the panel. Uh, it's a generic question. How can we better align these policies and speed? and reform at a national level so that we're not having inconsistent conversations with each state and territory and federal government. I guess I'm going first. Uh, so I think there's, there's some things that we're already doing. So uh, many of you may be aware that the uh, national waste policy was revised last year. There was some disappointment that that didn't include um, uh, binding targets for the measurement of the states. Um, but I think that reflects um, some really good, robust and ongoing discussions between the jurisdictions. All right, I've actually been remiss. So we're going to scrap that. I've actually been remiss. They have an introductory <laughs> statement each. So my apologies, reading my own notes. So now I'm going to do is invite them up individually to speak and open their, <laughs> open their conversation with. Can we stay here? Because once we get up, the whole Done. It's, it's All right. And the reason I've forgotten that is where's Marcus's slide? Marcus, you can go next. It better turn. Marcus, I'm going to. Right. So, my apologies, everybody in the room. Marcus, guys, like. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Always a mess when you're around, but <laughs> we'll fix it for you, mate. Um, well, thanks for having me. And actually, I've been uh, in Australia now 21 years, and this is my first time in Coffs Harbour. And uh, my term as chairman is up uh, next month on the 25th, and I didn't want to miss out. So that's why I came over specially to, uh, to, to, to celebrate the 20 years with you. And uh, it was a great event last night and even a better event over the last couple of days. So very informative, and uh, hopefully uh, I, I will be back. I'll be back. Um, now, the Western Australia, we've got a strategy. It was actually launched by the Premier. And it made his uh, hit parade, it's uh, the top 12 priorities. So waste management is really, really in focus in Western Australia. We had a strategy um, in 2012, which was only about diversion from landfill. Uh, now, 2019, we've got a new strategy, the war strategy, waste avoidance and resource recovery strategy uh, to 2030. But even more importantly, uh, more important, we have a action plan. Because to have a beautiful document sitting on a shelf with no commitment and uh, no accountability for anybody, uh, nothing happens. So the action plan is even more important, in my uh, opinion, than the, uh, than the strategy itself. So I'll, I'll rush through the strategy a little bit to, just to explain the thinking behind it and why we ended up with the strategy like this. We actually had the strategy ready in July last year, but the minister wasn't happy uh, with the buy-in of other departments because uh, we worked together with the EPA and the Department of um, Water and Environmental Regulation, but it has to be a cabinet-wide, a government-wide um, initiative and buy-in. So um, we spent a lot of time, I went with the Director General and I, we met actually with six other Director Generals just to make sure there was commitment from all departments that was buy-in um, across the whole cabinet. And that was a fantastic exercise. And that why, uh, that's why the uh, launch was delayed until uh, February uh, this year. So um, we got three, three guiding concepts when we started uh, designing the document. Uh, number one, obviously, is the waste hierarchy. It's enshrined in our War Act. Um, and um, it's obviously the uh, avoidance is the most preferred and disposal last preferred. But what it's all about, it's about material recovery. You know, we don't want um, uh, jumping straight into energy recovery. Yeah, we, it's diverted from landfill. We're, we're recovering um, energy. We've done our job. No, no, it's all about material recovery. The second guiding concept is the circular economy. So we have to get away from this linear approach and go into circular economy. And I'm glad, Gail, we're aligned with, um, uh, with that um, uh, graph, actually. It's good. The third guiding concept is the behavior change. We have to change what we're doing today, uh, otherwise we can't um, expect a different outcome tomorrow. 
So it's all about attitude, the thought, the behavior, the action, and then we have different outcomes. We've got 50 strat strategies in our document, and they're all uh, split into three groups. It's all about knowledge, um, in, uh, implementing enabling infrastructure, and incentive, whether they uh, are levies or, um, or funding for initiatives. So the principles when we were designing the document was uh, it's a collective responsibility and partnership. Uh, we actually, uh, we've got two pages in there that are dedicated to what are the roles and responsibilities of the various levels of government. That's Commonwealth government, that's a state government, local government, regional councils, the community, uh, non-government organizations, and then obviously the individual as well. We want innovation and growth. There's money in waste. I've been in waste uh, almost 32 years, and there, there, there is uh, money to make, and, and it's a great industry to be in. But we need innovation and, and, and growing it. Better practice. We also always have to strive for uh, best practice. Waste as a resource, and we have to look after our own waste. We cannot leave it up to our kids to look after the rubbish we leave behind. Then our approach when we were um, developing the, uh, the document is that it's very much focused on the individual because it all starts with an action of an individual. You cannot fix it end of pipe. We've tried that over the last decade, having uh, MBTs and sorting facilities. You cannot fix it. We have to get into the hearts and the minds of the people, of the individual, to make the right choice to avoid waste in the first place and then put the material in the right bin so we can recover it. We want to have local solutions, so local markets and local processing. Don't cart it all over Australia. Um, we've actually put in a split in the targets between, and the strategies between waste generators and waste managers because they need different uh, strategies. We stuck to the traditional waste streams, so C&D, C&I, and municipal solid waste, and we looked at what the national context is, and we tried to align with that as well. We got new um, objectives. We got three objectives and targets. <clears throat> the new objective, so we, the old strategy only had uh, diversion from landfill. Now we've got avoidance. Uh, recover more value and resources and protect the environment. And I just blanked out the middle one. We actually have targets for the recovery, but I'm going to unpack that in the next slide. But I just want you to have a look at that um, protect one. So we actually kept, that's one of the ticks, uh, Mike, that you had wrong in your uh, table there. So we actually kept in 2030 not more than 15% of the waste generated can go to landfill in Perth and Peel. So that's, that's not a ban on landfill, but that's creating an expectation of not putting stuff into landfill but recovery. So I'm packing the recovery target, and you see there's the waste generators and the waste managers there in the middle, so there's different targets and different strategies to address these groups, these sectors. So we've got community and waste generators and government and industry, and the managers, obviously, the industry and the sector ourselves. Looking at the targets, um, the target for 2020 is 65%. We just upped that to 75%. We're now at 54%, so that, that shouldn't be too hard to achieve that. But by 2025, all local governments will have FOGO collection system. And why do we focus on FOGO? is because um, the municipal solid waste recovery in WA is actually going backwards. We used to be at 43%, now we're at 39%. And that's really bad, because it all starts at home. Everybody pays rates, everybody lives in a house. So if we start educating at the house that uh, organics are a valuable resource, and we actually source separate at the house, at the household, then we can actually then take that to the workplace and into public places as well. 2030, we increase the recovery to 75%, and this is very important. We've got two waste to energy uh, projects in, in Western Australia. Uh, uh, wait a while, not with waste to energy, we're actually leading the charge. Um, um, but from next year, recovery of energy only from residual waste, and we actually have a definition now of residual waste in Western Australia. Um, sorry. Oh, you're getting up, Mike, you're telling me what to, to move on. So we've got headline strategies, eight headline strategies, but um, what we've done then is actually, what's the action plan? What are we going to do now in the next 12 months? Action number one, consistent communications. So the state government is leading with a waste sorter toolkit, and it's made uh, free of charge available to every local government or business, and it actually uh, tells them how to roll out FOGO, how to um, uh, do the yellow lid bin implementation, and how to communicate with the community, free of charge, because some local governments don't even have the resources or funding to have educators. Action number two, uh, everybody will ha in Perth and Peel, uh, every household will have a FOGO system. If you have a two bin system, you can only expect a 33 recovery rate, 33 percent. If you have a garden organics only system, you can only expect a 48 percent recovery rate. If you go to FOGO, 65 percent plus. So what we've done, separation at the source is important. All local governments in Perth and Peel will have FOGO by 2025, and it will be f uh, funded or supported, not totally funded, but supported by state government from the levy. Action number three, sustainable procurement. We have to make sure there's uptake of uh, product and um, local markets. 
So we've been talking to the um, uh, Department of Finance for the Common Use Agreement to update that, to have make, sh make sure there's recycled content in it. We're working towards minimum recycled content in all products with the Department of Finance, Department of Communities, Department of Local Government, Department of Transport. And we're actually doing a trial now with road base, 25,000 tons and 400,000 tons um, if it's successful uh, in 2020. Action number four, every local government will have a waste management plan. We have local governments that don't even have a plan. I mean, how sad is that? These plans, uh, we're developing a model plan. These plans will have to go to the Director General of the Department. Uh, they will be checked whether they align with the waste, uh, state waste strategy, and then they can be implemented. Uh, action number five, waste levy. Uh, so we have a levy. It's actually put on hold for two years because we've got leakage. You've got leakage here to Queensland. We've got leakage, leakage out of the Perth metro area. We're missing about 800,000 tons. So we have to fix that leakage first before we put the levy up. So it has been frozen for the next two years. Action number six, infrastructure review, and we want to move to a needs-based approach, uh, similar to Victoria. Action number seven is um, data, um, uh, mandatory reporting. We have very poor reporting stats from the commercial sector. Local government, very good, 97% compliance. They give us their data, uh, waste collected, waste recovered, all of that. Uh, commercial sector, terrible, terrible, terrible. So it's going to be mandatory. It's going to be written into the licenses. Online reporting by 2020, and we actually added to My Council. I don't know whether that's a big thing here in the, in the East Coast, but we got a My Council website. You can see the, the, the financial health of a local government. You compare it with a different local government. Well, we now have the waste uh, stats on there as well. So you can look at the next council, how they're performing, and compare the rates they're actually paying, whether they're getting value for money. So transparency and looking at best practice. Action number eight, um, infrastructure uh, recovery um, and actually funding of that. And that's another tick that you should put on your, on your graph there, Mike. There's a million dollars open now to our uh, uh, community and, and industry engagement program. And next year, we're hoping that the minister will announce uh, much, more of, uh, much more funding for um, support of infrastructure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Very fulsome. So we'll go across the rest of the panel. Molly, would you like to make a few comments? Yes. Do you want to do it from there? Did you get a microphone? No, no, it's fine. All right. Set the scene. I'm going to be very quick in deference to the fact that Marcus hasn't spoken, spoken um, to you before and you've seen a lot of New South Wales EPA people up here or in various panels already. Um, just to emphasise some of the um, projects that we have underway in addition to the 20 year waste strategy which you've all heard about and, and discussed with me, thank you. Um, we also have just a couple of things to call out before someone else does it for me, um, are the recent um, MWU decisions, the construction and demolition waste recycling facility uh, regulation amendments which came into effect yesterday, the aim of which is to improve the quality and the quantity of recycled output from those facilities. We've also heard um, over the course of the last two or three, or coming up to two and a half days now, um, some of the really fantastic um, investments in time and resources that we're making at the New South Wales EPA. I want to call special attention to um, our circular op economy policy statement, which you would have heard um, more about from Natalie yesterday, and also to, of course, our ongoing investment through Wasteless Recycle More. You've heard some examples today. A really exciting one that you may have heard about on Tuesday is our investment in improving services and waste management in um, Aboriginal communities, 61 Aboriginal communities, and I hope that some of you had the benefit of hearing from three wonderful women who are working through that program with us um, on Tuesday. I'm going to stop there. There is so much going on in New South Wales. You've heard so much about it um, and maybe less from my colleagues. So I'll leave the space to them. Thanks. Thanks, Molly. Uh, Kylie? Kylie, you want to say something? Thanks, Mike. Um, it's a really exciting time for waste management and resource recovery in Queensland. We've got a lot going on um, and it's actually really not hard to know where to start and where to piece it all together, but I'll give it my best. Um, we are currently finalising a new waste management and resource recovery strategy for Queensland and hopefully that will be released in the next months or so. Um, basically what that strategy is doing is setting a coordinated framework for 
how we integrate and how we deal with waste management and resource recovery moving forward into the, the future. So the, the very ambitious vision that we have for our strategy is a zero waste society by 2050. Um, but essentially what that means is we understand that there are going to be some wastes that will always need to be landfilled in the foreseeable future. <coughs> Excuse me. So we're really looking at um, targets around 75% recycling, which will lift us from about 45%, which is where we are now. Um, and the additional 15% will be picked up through energy from waste um, facilities and recovery. So we're looking at about a 10% residual to landfill. Implementation of the strategy will be supported by the development of action plans and um, there's a, a whole suite of those that are currently under development. Um, and of course, the implementation will also be supported by the introduction of our waste disposal levy, which starts on the 1st of July. Uh, $75 a tonne for the bulk of the, uh, the wastes, 105 and 155 for uh, the low and high hazard regulated wastes. Um, and that's going to provide us with a, a very big opportunity big funding source, the government is committed to uh, at least 70 per cent of that levy revenue coming back into waste and environment, <clears throat> which is a big boost for us. Um, so under the strategy, some of the things that we're developing are a Queensland um, waste and resource recovery infrastructure plan. We really need to get shorter names for some of these things. Um, what that's looking at works just commenced on that um, and basically what it's looking at is how can we integrate our, our infrastructure needs around the state, Queensland being a very big state, very regional state. Um, we need to understand what our infrastructure needs uh, where we need to put it, um, how we link it all together, and then how do we get that material back out to the markets. <clears throat> um, so that's uh, stage one of that's going to be delivered in about August this year. Um, we're also developing a plastic pollution reduction plan, and that's looking at the whole range of plastics that are currently generated, not just at what's ending up in the litter stream, um, but there's certainly a lot of plastics that are out there in the agricultural se sector, the industrial sector, that really need some, um, some management and there are really good opportunities to collect and recover that material. Um, so the Plastic Pollution Reduction Plan is looking at uh, developing a matrix that will help identify where we put our priorities for plastic um, into the future. Uh, we're developing an organics action plan that will help support um, the priorities of the strategy. Organics is a big priority for us uh, at the moment and there's a lot of uh, opportunities in that space that the uh, organics action plan will help to identify. Um, oh gosh, where else are we going? Um, we're also developing an indigenous waste management strategy, so specifically aimed at the, uh, the 17 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island councils that we have um, and how can we get improved practices looking, looking at waste as the foundation to build um, a really solid uh, economic development for the areas and where we can actually make links with um, some of the, the larger councils that can provide that, um, that hub and spoke support for those communities. So we're just about to kick off work on that. And where else are we going? Um, we're also doing some work in the space of uh, a collection study, uh, which is basically looking at, at what the different collection methods for uh, the various waste streams, uh, MSWC and ICND um, broadly, so that we can look at where, um, well currently what we're currently doing, where we may be able to get some more efficiencies, where we, we may be able to get some synergies with um, some of the other activities that are going on. Um, so that's also about to kick off um, very shortly. Um, and I think I might leave it, oh, it's the most important thing. Um, an energy from waste policy discussion paper um, is also just being finalised for release, um, probably around about the same time as the, the final strategy is going to be put out, um, and basically that's setting the, the framework for us for how we look at energy from waste uh, in Queensland, setting some principles around uh, what we might be looking at, um, and 
I guess, how, how can we look at more than just the, the thermal capture, but um, some value add for uh, waste of fuels, um, biofuels, RDFs, those types of things, so that you've got more of a market and you're not putting all your eggs in, in one basket to minimise the risk. Um, so I think that will, that will do me for now. Um, so thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Kylie. Angela? Angela? Good morning. So I think it's fair to say that uh, Victoria saw some marked impacts from recent global disruptions to um, recycling markets. Um, and those marked impacts along with, um, were compounded by um, existing fragilities in the Victorian recycling market. And were, we saw also some uh, underlying and ongoing problems with um, I guess management of materials at recycling facilities. All of these things have worked together to mean that the Victorian government has been very focused on building the resilience and the effectiveness of our uh, recycling industry over the last couple of years. Um, so safety, resilience, um, building the market has been a focus. We're also looking ahead to um, the future with a circular economy policy as well. And I just want to talk a little bit today about all of those things and how they fit together. Uh, we're, we're lucky in Victoria that we have some really good um, building blocks, um, some foundations for this work. So we were the first state in, Victoria, in Australia to have long-term statewide waste and resource recovery infrastructure plan that's supported by seven regional implementation plans um, that are being capably implemented by our regional waste and resource recovery groups um, and strategies including a market development strategy, organic strategy and education strategy that are being ably implemented by Sustainability Victoria. We've also over the last few years been re revising our environment protection legislation and from 1 July next year um, our Environment Protection Act will um, include a general preventative duty for all Victorians and all Victorian businesses to take reasonable steps to protect, uh, to prevent harm to human health and the environment, and that will um, play out in the waste sector as, as in all others. Um, so, particularly since we saw the, the impacts of China's sword, um, the Victorian government released a recycling industry strategic plan. I want to talk a little bit about what that includes. Um, it included four uh, goals. The first one was to stabilise the recycling sector. So you may remember that um, there were a Victorian government came uh, came out with a $13 million package to support local governments through to the end of that financial year um, until because we saw a, a very significant increase in recycling costs in Victoria um, in the immediate aftermath of, of China's decision. Um, so most of that $13 million went to councils to get them through until they could reset their waste charges for the new financial year and also some immediate investments um, to leverage private investment in um, the recycling, in recycling facilities in Victoria, um, uh, particularly to, um, uh, to fill gaps in our reprocessing capabilities. The second goal is to um, increase the quality of recycling, uh, recycling um, uh, recycled materials in Victoria, so we've got $3 million for an education campaign. Um, we're reviewing our curbside collection system to consider how we can um, maintain more value in our recycled materials. Um, and there was a, an $8.3 million boost to our existing resource recovery infrastructure fund, which is an ongoing program of, of sustainability, sustainability Victoria's, which is um, leveraging private investment in, um, in much needed uh, infrastructure in Victoria. Um, the third goal is to improve the diversity and the productivity of our recycling sector um, and our um, uh, Metropolitan Waste and Resource Recovery Group is picking up um, some work there to, uh, alongside some of its other work, so it's doing some uh, collaborative procurements and it's a really important intervention from the Victorian Government, I think, um, to bring together uh, many councils' waste streams offer that to the market and invite new players um, who will invest in infrastructure um, in a way that they would not if councils were um, procuring those services individually. So the idea is that by, um, and we've seen this just recently, um, last week the Minister launched 
um, a new composting facility in southeast Melbourne that will take um, eight councils' waste, um, and it was built because those eight councils came together and collectively procured that waste stream. Um, the fourth goal of the recycling industry strategic plan is to um, build our um, markets for recycled materials. So um, that included an extra $2 million to Sustainability Victoria to continue their excellent RD&D program, which Carl Shanley spoke about um, so well yesterday. Um, and Sustainability Victoria is also doing work with agencies across Victorian government to consider where are the opportunities for Victorian government as the um, largest purchaser in Victoria to um, include more recycled content in the things that we procure, both in our government operations and also in our infrastructure developments. And the one that's um, closest to my heart, because I'm leading that one, is uh, our circular economy policy. Um, and that will consider what role um, the waste and resource recovery um, sector can play in a circular economy in Victoria, but we'll also look further and think about the role that all businesses, communities um, and households can play in um, making Victoria's economy more circular and how we interact with our built environment um, to um, use resources um, more sustainably. Um, I couldn't get away without a quick plug for our plastic bag ban, which will be coming in later this year. There'll be legislation before the parliament for, for that, and it will have effect before the end of the year. And, but that's just the beginning. We're also working on a plastic pollution prevention plan, um, which I hope uh, will be um, public soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go to Stephen. Good morning, everybody. So in, in South Australia, we've, uh, I'll start, I'll just touch on a few things that we're doing. There's uh, a whole range, and I can actually talk to any of them in question time, where you can catch me afterwards. But um, one of the key things we are uh, doing, so there is a single-use plastics discussion paper, which is out by Green Industries SA. Uh, the consultation has closed, and they're actually uh, looking at all the information that they've received and all the um, comments, etc., and it was one of the most widely responded to uh, your say is the website we use, uh, submissions that we've had. Um, it was actually went into the th thousands and thousands of people actually responding. Um, so the community interest in actually seeing the ban, if you like, on single use plastics or something being done about it is as obvious as anything can be seen. And you saw that today with the, with the video, it's very obvious for everybody. Um, we're also uh, <coughs> looking at a CDS review. So we've had a uh, con container deposit scheme since 1977, and uh, originally it did start off as a litter program. And we've recognised that it has shifted from being a litter program to actually a resource recovery program, the value to the state that it actually brings. Um, so last year, we collected, uh, and I understand others have schemes as well, and, and the numbers are probably quite relative, but we collected over 603 million containers for the 2017-2018 uh, financial year, and what that is is that's 603 million less containers which are out in the environment. So in itself it is a good thing, and it's actually, again, adding value into uh, the South Australian economy, um, as well as the uh, contributing to the circular economy. Some of the things we're also looking at, if you're considering the value is, so it's no longer about litter, it's about value of materials why would you not broaden the scope of CDS? What would that look like? What containers would you bring in? What types of materials would you bring in? And how would you capture that? Um, so that, that is currently underway. The consultation phase is finished, but we're undergoing a, a number of industry workshops, and we'll see how that progresses. So I don't have any really out, outcomes from that yet. Um, our state waste strategy is currently under review because we're up for the next iteration, so that's uh, still underway. And I can imagine without knowing what's in it, it's been run by Green Industries SA, Without knowing what's in it, I can imagine the circular economy will play a very strong part, as well as market development, as well as the avoidance side of things, which I think is, is something we talk about but don't really have a good idea. We do a lot of end of pipe solutions, which are, you know, let's put plastic in roads, let's build energy from waste plant. To be honest, it's a bit lazy. We can do so much more to avoid it and so much better in managing our resources from quite linear processes where things are dug out of the ground, used once, and put back somewhere into the ground or into the atmosphere or wherever it is. Um, so in South Australia, we've had, uh, if I go to sort of like a policy area, which is probably uh, more about what the EPA does, we still see static and growing stockpiles, so we have those issues. We still see waste, which is misrepresented, saying this is glass fines, when 40% is glass fines, the rest is just garbage. 
just small garbage, but it's garbage. We still see uh, illegal, illegal dumping of materials both on and off site, and we have, again, problematic waste such as asbestos, um, single-use plastics, et cetera, et cetera. And we do have a number of resources which continue to end up in landfill when there's opportunities for them to, to not do that. So those problems exist now, and it's things we've actually had a waste reform program underway for a number of years. Um, and while it is the core basics of what we are doing, which is about minimising environmental harm, it is also we've changed our objects to now to support the highest and best use of recovered materials. So we've actually shifted from just being an environmental harm sort of regulator to now about supporting the resource recovery market and having material circularity actually moving through a facility. So what we don't want to see, in which we had in the past, I have quite a large site, I get a gate fee for receiving some material, I stick it in the pile and I leave it there. It runs the risk of that it's an unsustainable resource recovered market because what they can do is undercut existing players actually put the time and effort and money into processing material um, and also it creates the abandonment risk that is there. And then as you see fires usually pop up, it doesn't take long for some bright spark with a match to go in there and set fire to it, thinking it either solve their problems or some vandal comes in and says, oh, this looks good, I'll just set fire to that. So we've had a number of legislative reforms. We've had a general mile to duty since the inception of the Environment Protection Act, which is 1993. And that is quite a powerful tool because it's very broad reaching. We also had landfill bans since 2010. And again, very powerful because we actually stopped that leakage, if I can use it for lack of a better term, of resources going into landfill never to be seen again. You can actually force people to actually do something with it and avoid that uh, simple get out of jail free clause. Uh, we focus very, he very heavily on the circulation of materials and addressing that abandonment of waste or the abandonment risk, and it's beyond environmental harm. So, if, for example, if you have a landfill which has been capped, you put stop holes on top, it's very difficult to argue environmental harm because it's an old landfill, it's stuffed. So you actually don't have very much of an opportunity to argue environmental harm. But now that we can argue circulation of materials, we've got a stronger emphasis to say that stop hole can't stay there, you need to move it. You need to uh, put some effort into actually moving it from raw waste to either a pre precursor to a product or actually make it to a product and get it back into the market. So that's the way that we're heading. Um, a number of those mechanisms we're using are things like financial assurances, which is again to chase the, to change the dynamics of uh, the finances so that people can't simply pocket the money and run away. Uh, we can actually require financial assurance, which actually now changes the dynamic of how profitable it is just to have a stockpile of material. And we've also changed, and this is very sort of the basics of legislation or of regulation through a condition of licence, we can now change uh, stockpile limits at any time. And again, because we've shifted away from environmental harm, we can change it because the circulation of materials is not happening. There's a risk of abandonment. You are stifling the market. We can actually change that stockpile limit. Now, having said that, there comes the element of risk because we understand that uh, the waste game is a feast or famine sort of game. You have a massive amount of material coming in and then you send it out. So there's certain limits in making it operational enough for, for the industry to, to actually be sustainable. Uh, we bring in aspects or uh, procedures around mass balance and good stockpile management. And with that, it really is about the, the driving technology and use of drones. We can now actually have profiles of stockpiles, the material type, and the likelihood that it's actually going to get back into the market and run a risk profile on that and, and sort of make some changes early in the piece rather than actually waiting until the stockpile is massive and someone is complaining. We're also looking at changing the manner of collection of levy. So it's not so much about how much the levy we collect or how much the, the, the price signal for the levy, but how we collect it to, to again, disincentivise that store on site and pocket the levy through the gate fee. Um, and we also have an energy from waste position paper, which is currently out, on, out for consultation. Um, a couple of things I want to say, some people have seen it, and we've had a lot of commentary around that as well. One of, a couple of the main things that we were trying to do when we developed the, the position paper is actually give some regulatory certainty. We've actually shown our cars to say, if you, if you want to build an energy from waste plant, this is, this is the barrier. This is what's expected of you, and now people can make an informed decision. Without that position paper, we had nothing. And people would come and see us, and we'd give them some advice, and they'd say, okay, but where does it say that I have to do that? And we could say, well, that's the best advice we got at the time. Now that at least they know where the line of the sand is, and if it actually stacks up, excellent, good luck to you. Uh, one of the key things that we have in that, so levy is, is, is a key aspect to uh, whether an energy from waste plant is viable or not. And we've said, if you are an energy from waste plant where you burn waste, levy will apply. Because we recognise it is. You can have a debate whether it's better than landfill or whether it's not. 
but in reality, it's very close to being landfill. Like you don't actually get much more value out of that. And an energy from waste plant is not about electricity; it is waste management through and through and through. Um, we have those said. Look, if you actually manufacture a fuel, so you actually process that material and you manufacture a fuel which is at a spec that we have agreed, then no levy applies. Go your hardest, and that's where we want to see people to go because we want to maintain that recovery of resources. What we don't want to do is have all the work that we've done with source segregation, put it all back together, throw it in an incinerator, and call that energy recovery. Call it, call it whatever you will, but that's not what we want to see because it will under, undermine all the good work that we've done in a state as well as the expectations of our community. So again, I'm happy to talk, talk to more of those as people wish, um, and happy to uh, take comments here or later on. Thank you. Last but not least, Alex. Thanks, Mike. Um, I was actually starting to feel a bit worried there. The ACT is pretty small. I just wanted to make sure that we, we didn't get lost behind the biggest states there. Um, Look, in the ACT, we, we, are a small, we are a small jurisdiction, but uh, we also have a very unique position as well because we're the local council as well as the state government. Um, so that actually gives us a very broad perspective. Um, and so certainly, and I've talked to a lot of people in the room here over the last two days, so council people, state people, and all of these issues resonate with me because these are the kind of things we deal with all the time. Um, so, we, so, so I sit in ACT, no waste, so we're, we're all about delivering service to the ratepayers of the ACT. We're worried about uh, waste in terms of the environment, we're worried about it in terms of the economics, the social side of things as well. So we contribute to the national agenda and we also link in internationally as well. So we wear a couple of different hats. Um, and one of the things too I think that's come out from the uh, earlier speakers is actually there's a lot of collaboration that's underway. Uh, between the states and territories specifically to deal with some of the issues. Um, I actually I, I manage the, the waste regulation side of things and what's, what's really interesting to me is actually the amount of work that's going into updating and contemporising uh, legislation managing waste and I can see that in WA, um, in Victoria, New South Wales, um, all, all across the board really and, and so I think that's a, that's a really great achievement that that collaboration and improvement is actually happening behind the scenes um, that a lot of people in the room here won't see. Um, in the ACT, we've got a waste strategy that came into effect in 2011 and it runs until 2025. So we're kind of closer to the end than the beginning now. There's a lot of things that are actually happening. There's a lot of work that's, that's, that's going on. Um, we have a roadmap that outlines a series of interventions and, and in that we've got uh, We've got things like, for example, moving towards uh, FOGO. We're looking at bulky waste. Um, we're rolling out green bins across the ACT. Um, and certainly close to my heart is the regulatory framework. So we have the Waste Management and Resource Recovery Act, which came into effect in 2017. What we do through that legislation is we license all waste facilities in the ACT, irrespective of size and type of waste. So there's no thresholds, providing you meet the definitions, you're in. And we have, um, I think it's 60 facilities at the moment in the ACT. Those of you who have been to the ACT will, will wonder where are these facilities. They are there, they're in warehouses, they're out of the way, they're in the industrial areas. You won't necessarily know but they're there and we have the full suite of all of the other facilities that you guys have in the bigger jurisdictions just in a much smaller area and our scale is different. Um, we also make all of our waste facilities report on their waste activities every quarter. So all of the movements of waste, so it's mandatory reporting. So we're just starting to, you know, to embark on this journey now of collecting this data. And Mike was talking before about data. Data, data is something that's desperately needed and accurate data. What's actually really happening in the industry and where is this stuff going? Um, so there's a story there to, to unpack and, and to tell. Um, we also regulate all the waste transporters and at the moment we've got around about 150 businesses operating in the ACT and we regulate a fleet of about 1,200 vehicles. So a small jurisdiction and that shows you the scale of actually what's, what's happening and it is, it is incredible. Um, moving forward as well, we've, we've got a container deposit scheme that came into effect in, uh, at the end of June last year. So we're coming up to one year. Um, we're reflecting back, we're looking at a lot of lessons learned and we will be making some tweaks and changes and so on to improve it in terms of the um, customer service experience. 
So uh, more opportunities to redeem your containers. Um, that, that's, that's the kind of thing we're looking at there. Um, we've got a Plastic Bag Ban Act in the ACT, which came into effect in 2011. Uh, now, we've reviewed that recently and inspired through that review, but also what's happening on the broader stage, uh, we're also looking at single-use plastics and circular economy issues as well. So we're hooking into that. Um, waste energy, uh, sorry, going back to the single-use plastics, we've actually got a discussion paper that's uh, out there now for comment. So um, anyone, welcome to comment. Have a look on your say in the ACT. Um, I think Mike's getting nervous there about questions. So two more things, just to wrap it up very quickly. Waste to energy, we've actually got policy development underway. It's gone out um, as a discussion paper for public consultation. We're digesting and, uh, and considering, I guess, the feedback that we've got from that process before we move forward. Um, and the other thing, too, a waste levy. Um, there's been, through this presentation, a number of slides that have talked about a waste levy in the ACT. Um, Technically, we don't have a waste levy. What we have is a gate fee, a variable gate fee at our landfill. We're actually looking now at designing and bringing in a waste levy that's, that's um, you know, got moving parts, got some complexities that's going to drive certain things um, and essentially uh, enable us to fund uh, various programs uh, and to invest in the waste sector. So it would actually bring us, I guess, more in line with my colleagues uh, on the panel here. Very good. All right. Thanks, Mike. Thank you all. Well, you've heard a lot of information. We're going to hand straight over to you at this point in time, so think about your questions. Uh, do I have someone who wants to go right here at the front here? Uh, what I might ask you to do is direct, try to direct it to one person so we don't have six responses. That will take up a lot of time. Thank Good morning. You. My name is Roger. I'm working with Inesco, the incinerator ash company, uh, coming from Europe. A question to uh, the panel, actually to all of you, but uh, in general to Marcus because it ties into one of your slides. Uh, Marcus, in, the, in your slide on the waste hierarchy, you excluded energy from waste from materials recycling. As we learn in Europe that energy from waste actually contributes to, to materials recycling. It can recycle the so-called non-recyclables. And actually by the residue, which con consists of the um, uh, unburnables, those become now recyclable because they are freed from their plastics and their, their organics. So what's the, what's the reason why you exclude the energy from waste from the materials recycling percentages? Well, that's a fantastic question, uh, Roger. Um, the, well, there's a bit of a myth happening as well, I think, in, um, in, in Australia and maybe worldwide, you know, because no one is really sure what is the residue, because I keep hearing numbers 2%, uh, 5%, and, and I know uh, from experience it's more like 20% or 25%, so the bottom ash and... And the fly ash obviously has to go to landfill, but bottom ash can be recovered. But um, for me, it doesn't make sense to burn 100% to get 22% out. Um, I, mean, that's, uh, I think that's a bit the wrong way. That's not very circular. But of course, bottom ash can be recycled if the heavy metals are re removed and, and it can be applied. Instead of landfill, it can be applied as a uh, road construction product. But um, I don't think that's the way we want to go. And, and we, uh, we definitely don't want to see material recovery to burn it first and then to justify energy from waste. But, uh, but obviously, it, it's a good outcome if you can recover the bottom ash. Yeah. All right, another question? Down the front here. Hi, good evening, or good morning. <laughs> Where am I? Uh, I guess my question is to all of you, perhaps Molly, though, but feel free to answer it. Uh, mine's about organic waste streams. and. If we look at some of the other countries, like South Korea, who have created a, uh, a ban on, on organic waste going into other bins, and hugely successful, I think we're up to 92% of recycling their organic waste, what would that conversation look like in Australian legislation, and is that possible? These are much better than the questions we served up to you, Mike, to be Dixers, so this is great. I'm glad we went straight to the audience. Um, so I think we can see in the Australian context... I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name. Oh, Peter. Peter. Peter, I think we can see in the Australian context that bans are a, a live possibility, and we see that in South Australia in, in particular, and it's not just organics that you banned. Um, it's also e-waste. And we can see the result, how the market responds to that really clearly, which is a great example um, for others of us. So when in New South Wales, 
the way we plan to attack it, for want of a better expression, is um, to think about the options that we can put forward to government as part of our 20-year um, strategy, and I've been talking to some of you about what those options might be. So which end or which part of the market do we intervene in? Do we intervene um, at the end of, end of pipe and push away from the landfill? Do we think about um, perhaps more of uh, the approach that they're taking in WA, or do we bring it back to the individual? That's two options right there. Uh, and what infrastructure, and when I talk about infrastructure, I don't just talk about, uh, I don't just mean buildings that can process organic material. I'm also talking about what do your bins look like? How are they collected? What, are, are, there, are there any middle um, processing that has to take place before it gets to its destination of optimization and can be returned um, to the market? So I think, yeah, there are a number of options that we can, we can take. Some of them will have um, greater immediate impact. Um, others of them may have less immediate impact but may be more palatable um, to, to government or maybe more economically viable in the short term. So those are the range of options as, as we might put them forward. I'd encourage you as well to talk to me about that more and also to talk to my colleague uh, Amanda Kane who leads our organics um, push for the um, EPA and has already made some extraordinary uh, achievements with you in that space but is always thinking about how we can, we can do more. And of course the experience of the other jurisdictions I think is really valuable Two, um, Mike, would you like to hear? If someone else wants right. to make it. Can I just add? Hang on. Yep, good. Uh, can I just add? There is. Um, there was an interesting read. The UN published a single-use plastics roadmap, and they did talk about bans. As, and if you look at sort of the policy, and they looked at I think it was 55 countries from memory, and the, the policies relating to plastic and bans have sort of shot up exponentially. And what they've said in there is there are some genuine benefits to it, but the, the results are mixed. And sometimes because I think people forget if you, imply, if you uh, require a ban or instill a ban, you actually need to regulate that. And, and also you need to collect the data to see is it actually working. So sometimes it's an easy thing to say, well, let's just ban it. But sometimes it doesn't work because you have either a black market kicks in, you have no viable alternatives, or you have poor compliance and monitoring. So like as in regulatory... Um, control and oversight. So you have to keep that in mind. There, there is no one solution to address all our problems here. I think in terms of domestic food and garden organics, we've seen a major transition in the last 10 years. I mean, all of Metro uh, Perth, all of Adelaide, Victoria, uh, and moves, very significant moves in New South Wales. Uh, so there's been a massive reform at the domestic level. What, what is really missing is commercial organics, and there's very little movement in that space. Question at the front. Brian Stephan, Penrith City Council. I was just add on to Mike. Ten years ago, Penrith introduced FOGO, voluntarily took the lead, and diversion rates are just, you know, increased exponentially. Um, we've got the experience, we've got the data, and I'm still hearing, you know, is it a good idea or not? I can tell you it is. The community can tell you it is. Um, it was a lot of work to introduce it, so I was pleased to hear Molly talk about possibly a mandate there for all of New South Wales. Um, probably some recognition for early adopters if there's a decision there, but we can talk about it. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. I'm conscious up the back. Alex? Thanks, Mike. Alex Sopo here, NWRIC. Um, I was really encouraged by Alex Taylor's comments about licensing every waste facility in the ACT, and I was wondering if I could hear from the panel about uh, further licensing for waste facilities and potentially registration for waste transporters. I can start. In South Australia, we've always licensed anyone that transports or collects or recycles, and there is no limit. Um, and what that's done is really bring the players into the light so you can actually influence and change their behaviour. Uh, one of the things which we often see, it's that black market that undermines all the good work. That, and they're not here. To be honest, those people that do that are not here. And they're not just in the waste game, they're everywhere. And you have elements of serious organised crime as well. So licensing them increases that barrier to entry and it's not just someone getting a truck and starting to transport. They actually have to do something about it and others can actually dob them in so you can actually take action. So we found licensing everybody is one of the best things you can do. Um, in, in Western Australia, we, we have an issue with a lot of facilities that are not licensed because the department 
just said, well, we don't need them licensed, we just keep an eye on them. Um, which is very bad, because you have no control over if they do the wrong thing or they don't give you information, what do you do? You, you got nothing to take off them. So um, the Waste Authority has strongly been suggesting since 2010 that uh, we should have mandatory way bridges, mandatory licensing, mandatory reporting of uh, mass balances and all of that. So we're in a reform process and hopefully at the end of this um, reform review, uh, waste reform, uh, we actually will have licenses for all sites. For example, MRFs for the yellow bin are not licensed in Western Australia, which is very strange because waste comes from a household. Um, and this uh, con construction demolition uh, sites are also not licensed. So um, on the other hand, uh, organic waste processes are over um, uh, regulated. So there, there needs to be that balance. But every way a site that takes more than 500 tons of uh, waste should be licensed in the waste authority's point of view. Uh, I would just add that um, the new Environment Protection Act in Victoria gives uh, different it brings new, new licensing arrangements. So we now have a, a gradually will have a graduated approach to to licensing. We'll have licenses or permissions or registrations, and they can be applied. Um, appropriately so that kind of big players have um, detailed licence conditions and... Just hold it up, it's not working. Um, there we go. Uh, yeah. uh, smaller and so smaller um, or uh, less risky activities can be still registered with the EPA but um, have less onerous restrictions on them. Um, EPA and, and DELP will be consulting on the subordinate regulations under the new Environment Protection Act um, this year, and I would encourage industry to engage in those discussions because there is lots and lots of details to be sorted through. So in, in Queensland, we've just introduced um, some significant reforms for how we regulate waste activities in Queensland and how we identify regulated wastes. Um, so we've gone to a much more risk-based approach for both of those. Um, we've introduced a testing regime for regulated waste so that people who are generating those sorts of waste can actually do a test to determine whether or not it exceeds um, threshold limits. If it is below threshold limits, it can um, fall into the not regulated category and it can be managed as, as a general waste, which um, reduces a lot of costs and, and approval requirements, and, and, but that's a recognition of the fact that it's a lower risk um, in managing that material. Um, in the reform of the waste-related activities, um, we've done quite a bit of consolidation and modernising of those activities in recognition of um, the fact that our, our regulations were 20-something years old and they hadn't kept up with new technologies, new activities, new processes. So we've, we've done quite a lot of, um, of that sort of thing, um, looking more at, uh, at resource recovery facilities rather than you know, strictly transfer stations and um, incineration and those sorts of things. So um, some of those uh, uh, provisions have already commenced. Some of them are transitioning to a commencement um, within by the end of this year. Um, so there's still a fair bit of work to be going on. Um, in the transport space, we're working with the waste industry and with our um, uh, waste recycling um, industry association in Queensland to develop a code of practice for general waste transporters. We currently do license and track regulated waste transporters, um, but general waste is, um, is a different kettle of fish. So we're actually working with the industry on a registration process so that we know who's um, active in that space and a code of uh, practice for how they should be um, managing the waste. Working with generators also to, uh, so that they know what questions to ask their transporters when they come and collect um, the material. So, um, yeah, so there's a bit happening in that space as well. Question over that way somewhere? No? Uh, Mike, Mike, can I just add something to the last one really quickly to, oh, just further to the, the question. Um, one thing in the ACT as well that we do is, um, we, when, when we brought in our new licensing scheme, we had a lot of existing facilities, which always presents a challenge. So there was a lot of work with those facilities to, um, I guess, step them up to a new standard. Uh, and what we've done is we've actually imposed stockpile limits and controls uh, in our license conditions as a bespoke activity. So everybody is regulated uniquely, and we can do that in a small jurisdiction. Um, the other thing too, like I said before, we're not just tied to con being concerned about environmental harm. So the conditions in our licences are very, very broad. So we look at health and safety, we look at economic considerations, 
um, you know, we try and get the best overall outcome for, for what's actually, um, you know, what can be achieved from that particular facility. Uh, and in doing this exercise, we, we have uncovered some uh, unexpected things. We've um, uncovered stockpiles of materials that uh, have been there for a long time in warehouses and so on, which is exactly what everybody else would find. Uh, and people wouldn't think it's necessarily a problem in the ACT, but, but it is, and, and we are addressing it through the licensing regime. Ron? Hi. Uh, my name's oh, Alice. Go there, all right, and then oh, Ron. I'm, <laughs> um, I'm from Ask Waste Management, and look, it's encouraging to see you all today and, you know, taking the waste portfolio forward. Um, I guess my concern is the disparity that's starting to occur, that I feel is starting to occur, between rural and regional services and metro services. Um, I'm from WA, so Marcus, this is probably aimed at you. Um, I live in a small town of 12,000 people. I've also had the opportunity to manage the waste services at that local government. Now there's still people without curbside collection. There's still uh, the digger, you know, bury it, bury it in the backyard and waste is free and it doesn't cost anything. Our intense pressure for rate rises to do anything about improving your waste services that are delivered. So I feel that, you know, we've got 50 or so local governments in the Perth and Peel region and there's another 101 out there where the news of waste strategy is sort of silent or they're sort of missing them. I mean, they, they need funding and I suppose mine is more of a plea, you know, please don't forget us. There's, you know, you've got communities that are demanding services that you're always having to sort of say but the cost is so intense and then it becomes a council issue and then waste just gets sort of left by the wayside. So I suppose... My question, my sort of plea is, you know, funding, please make it available as part of this new waste strategy um, in terms of infrastructure, you know, improving be better practice, but it has to hit the regions as well. Go, so, Marcus. Okay, well, um, thanks for the question, and um, <clears throat> we can write you a check later, no worries. Um, <laughs> now, but the, um, the issue is that 80% of the waste in Western Australia is generated in Perth and Peel. And, uh, you know, where do you start? Where the, where the bulk is, because when you achieve our targets. What's that? Oh, thank you. Yeah. This is a bit of a... He's from Ask as well. This is a tag team. Any more here, Ask people? Uh, no checks for you. Uh, but um, but in, uh, in reality, um, you know, we've got the, the Better Bins program, which is funding of the three-bin system and to get the consistency rollout. That's available for regional centers as well. And it's interesting that you touch on this uh, thing, you know, the rollout of three-bin system best practice. And I argue, why would you start in a regional area with rolling out a yellow bin, which you have problems with markets and uh, tyranny of distance, why don't you start with the rollout of the, of the green bin and actually collect uh, organics and you can process them in a regional center as well and actually use the, the material for soil conditional because we need it in, in Western Australia. So there's, there, there's available availability for funding. There's actually a round out for $1.4 million. There's $30 per household available for a three bin system. Um, um, yes, but we're, we're definitely looking at regional centre as well. I think the point that Marcus was raising is that if you don't have a curbside recycling bin or an organics bin and you're rural and remote, a long way from markets, then doing organics, you can compost locally, you can create jobs locally and you're not dependent on China for your material stream. So I think it's the summary of that. Another question over there. No? Ron. Oh, sorry. Another question over there. Someone put their hand up. Ron, over here. Thank you very much. Um, what I've heard, uh, I think, is, is really good. There's a lot of interesting stuff, a lot of good stuff happening in all the jurisdictions. But there is an elephant in the room, which we started to address right at the very beginning, Mike, and then got sidetracked. And that question is, what is being done to harmonise and bring into line the regulations between the jurisdictions. It came out very clearly in the panel session yesterday morning that in a, in a small country like ours, population-wise, 25 million people, it really is silly to have all these different systems. I call it as railway gauges on steroids. Surely we can bring this all together and make something that's cohesive, uniform and harmonised across the country. So what is happening? What is the plan to try and achieve that? Um, I, I don't know whether we're in a position to actually fix that, but uh, I think we all agree that we should harmonise information and data. We should harmonise regulation. We should harmonise planning. And we should harmonise education and uh, awareness and engagement. 
Um, and these are all foundational um, uh, strategies in, in our state waste strategy. But it needs a federal government to actually implement a system that it actually works. Because I always hear the excuse, coming from Holland, uh, uh, 12 provinces. Uh, here we've got uh, six states and, and territories. And uh, we're a federation of states. That's why we can't do it. So we're just looking for excuses not to do it. But there's bigger reasons to actually do it and, and, and make it. But why do we have different driver's licenses in every state? You know, I can't even fix that. But, you know, but the thing is that we should work towards it, but it has to come, obviously, from uh, the federal government. And, uh, and we have to make sure that it, we don't get railroaded by too much regulation and too much red tape. It should be a very hands-on um, uh, approach. Does it, yep. the, um, the review of the national waste policy has gone a long way to helping with that because it certainly identified a lot of areas where... Um, across jurisdictions, um, but also has clearly identified where there are um, specific roles that the Australian government needs to step into and where there are roles for jurisdictions and local governments. Um, that, but, but obviously everyone here is talking about you know, transitioning to a circular economy. Everyone here is talking about energy from waste and, and what the next big things are. So there are, there are some very clear principles and um, guidances and processes, I guess, that, that we can probably all agree on and harmonise within in that broader policy space. Um, and obviously a lot of the, the how and the operational things are still going to be state-specific because Queensland, like Western Australia, is a big state. It's not going to be a one-size-fit-all, um, not like ACT. <laughs> yeah. Anyone not else want to Alex, comment on that? So, uh, I mean, we hear about this all the time. And you're right, the, I think we're pretty clear and everyone's sort of heading in the right direction. But what I... My personal view, so I won't take this as an EPA point of view, but my personal view, it's that there's a failure of an execution strategy, is what it is. We all, we have national policies, and we had, the old one was, no, it was it's better now, don't get me wrong. Uh, the other one was quite good, but there was no real clear accountability. How do you govern it to ensure that it's going in the right direction? How do you monitor that the progress is being made? And you do have to factor in, as Australia is so vast and so different, it does make it much more complex. And you do have to factor in that you have people that just don't want to change. We in South Australia still, we have three bins for almost all of our councils. They still can't decide whether the residual bin is a blue lid or a red bin. How, how hard can that be? <laughs> I should step down now. That's the final comment. Um, La sorry. Last couple of questions. Sorry, Ron. Uh, can I just jump in really quickly too? Yes, yesterday there was a challenge thrown to, to us as government by the, uh, the industry leaders panel. Um, which was calling on us to, uh, to um, you know, get consistency in our legislation, to get consistency in our strategy and so on. And certainly we are taking steps towards that. But I'd, I'd actually like to throw uh, the challenge back to the industry leaders as well and say, well, well what are you doing? Because you, you look at the, the products that come out of, um, uh, out of facilities. Okay, we're trying to turn them into a, into a, into a product that we can sell into the market. So is industry looking at things like developing national standards and driving that kind of thing? Because that doesn't necessarily have to come from us. It can come from industry to say, this is the specification for the material. All of a sudden, what you've got is you've got engineers who will have trust in a product, manufacturers who will use that product. So I throw the challenge back as well. It, it does flow both ways. All right, good point. Mike Hayward, and then last comment there, and then last question, and then we'll have to wrap up. I can see the fear in Steve's face. He knows I'm going to ask him a question. I've been hearing a little, or oh, Steve shared about uh, bans, various bans that we have in South Australia. The ban I'm interested in is the ban on the weekly collection, or the ban on fortnightly collections of um, the residual waste bin. Given that we're, I'm currently working in an area that has a weekly FOGO collection, and it's working very nicely in a fortnightly residual collection. If we're going to head down the track of trying to pull FOGO through our curbside, um, is it time for South Australia to have a discussion about allowing councils to opt into a weekly collection for a bin? And if it's the food organics bin, move the food organics from the residual bin into the green bin, collect that weekly, and then the residual bin, what's it got in it? Nappies. Thanks, Mike. Sort of. Um, 
I'll answer this one very, very carefully because at the time that the 2010 policy was made, it was hotly debated. The, the mandate of a weekly collection was not in the policy. And if you had a look at the comments from the community, people went nuts. Absolutely crazy. And, and whether it was rightly so or not, it sort of became irrelevant whether it was right or not. Um, so what it ended up with that it was mandated it has to be a weekly bin collection for your residual bin. So you actually had no choice. Uh, just to be clear, it's only in the metro area, non-metro area you can do that. And some have actually taken that step and successfully you know, done uh, twice weekly or fortnightly collections. So um, I don't know if I can really answer it very well, Mike, for you. But, uh, but well, we might uh, yeah. have to take that People are detail asking that offline. Question, so, yeah. I'm conscious of the time. Uh, last question there, and then we're going to wrap it up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Janelle Wallace from the Soft Landing Mattress Product Stewardship Scheme and the Responsible Construction Leadership Group for Two Hats. Um, we've talked... So last year there was a review of the Product Stewardship Act, the Federal Product Stewardship Act, for which we've not seen a result yet. And I'm noticing that a lot of um, circular economy policies from the states are talking about product stewardship. Um, again, one of those things, I guess, commonality would be really useful. I, my question is, um, how do you look, do you see um, providing assistance to the development of um, schemes in terms of addressing free riders, which is often the biggest obstacle to voluntary schemes? And then also in the implementation, um, do you have any comments on how we can collectively work on the logistics that um, is a big issue in, in servicing regional areas and making it cost effective? Who wants to have a go? <laughs> so I'll, I'll address the last part of that first. Um, part of the collection study that we're looking at is certainly how can we get better transport synergies so that um, if, if, if someone's going out, they're collecting, for example, e-waste or tyres or something else or, or um, containers, can they collect everything at once so that you're not taking three trucks out there to, to collect three separate things? And I think as more material starts to be collected and diverted from landfill, um, those sorts of opportunities for, for backloading, for um, you know, alternative transport, certainly for hub and spoke models, so you've got aggregation points, um, is going to become a very important feature. Um, and I, I, and I, I keep saying Queensland's a very large state and there's lots of open spaces. Um, and people in regional and remote communities um, have the same right and, and should have the same expectation that their waste is going to be managed appropriately for um, for their needs. Um, so we can't ignore the fact that there's there's tyres generated, there's white goods generated, there's e-waste, and, and there's a whole lot of wastes that um, that should be collected and available for uh, for markets and for processing. So um, yeah, so that that's what we're looking at. It's not just looking at about um, curbside and, and how we can get more you know, curbside bins to um, out into regional areas, but a, a whole collective of, of all of the waste um, and product stewardship. That'll so Free riders. Well, just yeah. hand it off. That, that's we'll a bigger someone. question than this. It's too much. <laughs> Anyone else want to comment on that? Okay, I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, clearly, waste is big. It's complex. There's lots of views. There's lots of politics. It's a complicated beast. But we've heard very expansive talks from you know, six governments that are all basically heading in the same direction. And that is in itself worth celebrating. And various speeds of reform. I think the feel from the room is the more consolidation and harmonisation we can get, the better. But we are all heading, the ship of state is moving that way and that is a brilliant thing. And would you join with me in thanking the six speakers?